Howdy once again, it's Tubal Cain, and this is part two of my series on uh, surface roughness or uh, the surface finish. And today, in this part, I'm going to talk about this uh, surface profilometer that was given to me by Nick. It's a portable, portable profilometer used to check raw or average roughness of uh, finished work, machined work. Be sure and go back and look at part one if you haven't seen it where I discuss just the highlights of uh, surface roughness and what it's all about. It's a rather complicated subject, not my total area of expertise, so I did gloss over some things and if you want to know more about it you really need to read books on this because uh, there are entire uh, books and treatises written on this and, and men that have spent their lifetime studying this and developing these techniques so this is this is just what an old shop teacher knows about surface roughness in the last video I talked about these uh, surface comparators or, or surface roughness gauges and those were used to, ch to check the uh, the roughness or the finish of machined work by inspectors or machine operators and that's very subjective uh, it is uh, subject to opinion uh, as to what the roughness or the surface actually is now we're able to quantify it more accurately using one of these surface uh, profilometers now this is a portable one they have larger ones that uh, are used in laboratories this one uh, can even be taken out onto the uh, work site or, or laid on work out in the shop or on the milling machine moved around and it is battery powered by a 9 volt this is a Taylor Hobson made in the UK called a Sertronic 3 Plus now this probably is an older model because I noticed on here that the last time that it has been calibrated is a 08 June of 08 this is where the battery goes there's the trade name and serial number and all of that it's got three legs you know it's like a milking stool doesn't matter what you set it on it's not going to wobble now I did use this one with uh, and I checked it with the uh, uh, sample and it is not right on so it probably needs a new stylus uh, or needs to be recalculated uh, calibrated but it is certainly accurate enough for the purposes of this demonstration the control panel is right on the front there's just a few buttons I do not have a manual for this so I'm sure I'm using it at about 10 percent of its capability it'll go off by itself and then on this end again you saw that there's a port here and that could uh, be plugged right into a printer or perhaps a computer I'm not sure but uh, graphs and prints can be made of the work and the samples that you are testing now how does this work you notice when I turn it on here and get it traveling that we're going to have about a half inch of travel here so we're going to cover a sample of the work about a half inch long now you'll see it return and during that time it's calculating and then it'll read that out notice here on the arm goes up and down like a railroad crossing and on the end of this there is a tiny diamond or stylus or probe that needs to be cleaned with a camel hair brush but in this case it's just going to have to be some hog bristle from China tiny little diamond on there about the size of the diamond that I gave my wife when we got engaged let's take a close-up look at that stylus that little diamond the little probe and this cheap lens does quite a nice job doesn't it but there's the little diamond 
That's about as close as I can get. And it appears to be in good condition. Look at how small it is compared to that monstrous tip of a, of a pencil. And you can see how it's mounted in a little float. So if you bang it around, that red ring there, and I forgot what that is called, uh, apparently takes the shock. You almost cannot see any of this with the naked eye, so this is a pretty good view for you and I. You're almost not going to be able to see it. That's about as close as I can get. And what that is doing is going to go across the work for a half inch. Let that represent the work. And the diamond is just going to uh, uh, follow the contour of the finish. And we talked about the lay, so we have to uh, uh, operate this across the lay at 90 degrees to the lay. Go back and look at the other video if you haven't seen it. No matter how smooth your work may seem after machining it, it really isn't that smooth and uh, this is what it's going to look like if you can magnify it greatly enough and this is the, uh, the diamond or the stylus that is traveling across a half inch and then taking an average reading which again we call the Ra or I call it the Ra Roughness Average Remember that there are other ways of determining uh, roughness too as well as this, but this is the most common one that, that would be used in a factory and that is often specified on a drawing like this and that's the symbol for it. So we're going to take some readings here in a minute. Now the Taylor Hobson has to be adjusted so that this arm is parallel with the work so that only the diamond stylus is touching so you can move it up and down as you can see here and then tighten it here when it is uh, parallel and you can look through here perhaps put some light back here or a little feeler gauge to, to make sure that the diamond itself, the stylus itself, is touching the work and not part of the arm. And this is what it looks like from this angle when it's actually operating. You have to make sure that the work is clean as well. No chips or oil or anything else on there that will give you a false reading. Can you see it traveling? Now it's calculating and then it will stop. Quite an amazing machine and I think this would be quite expensive to buy. This test specimen came with us when uh, Nick sent it to me. And it has been calibrated also in 08. And they put a little seal of wax or plastic on there so they can't be tampered with. And look what this looks like, if it's not too shiny to show you. This one is very much beat up from being around a shop. But at the top it says uh, Precision Devices, which is I guess just the name of the company. And we can calibrate the instrument with this top sample. And it shows what it should be on the one side in uh, micro inches or Ra, and then the other side for you guys over in Europe, and really the rest of the world, it's in metric. And the instrument will do English or metric, but I'm going to do all of this in micro inches, much to the dismay of some of you. And then looking at the next sample here, this is one that should read 19 micro inches. You can see there's an awful lot of scratches on that. That's for checking the stylus and notice the arrow there telling you which direction to run it. But this has been abused over many years. And then the bottom sample here also is, oh my, 
magnified. It's really scratches, scratchy, isn't it? So we should get uh, get this reading. So let me take a couple readings on here, and I'm going to find uh, from practicing here. I've already found out that the readings are going to be fairly close to this, but not exactly. And that may be due again to the thing is out of calibration or the diamond has been damaged or banged around from being in a shop. I'm all set up, the work is clean, and I'm ready to take a sample reading on the middle one here. And we should get a reading of something around uh, 19 uh, micro inches. So I'll turn the machine on, the instrument, if you will, on, and then that starts the cycle. about a half inch of travel. It's calculating and let's see what we got. That's hard to read. It, I have to raise the arm here so I don't damage anything. I've got 20 micro inches raw on the sample that reads 19, so it's mighty close, isn't it? Now if I wanted to, and I had a printer, I could push print and I suppose it would do a graph of this. I'm not real sure. I've seen pictures of these printers. Or I suppose it would enter it into a computer. Now that I've checked the calibration of the instrument, let's go ahead and take some readings on uh, some samples that I made here in the shop. Now this is aluminum and I've milled this on the Bridgeport mill and there's three different passes on here. The top one here where it says F that is uh, 1100 RPM and I fed it rather fast. Well that's not a very accurate way of saying things but I hand fed it since I do not have a power feed relatively fast. And then on uh, the, the middle one there that says S I've Fed it, fed the uh, the work relatively slow at 1100 RPM, and the depth of cut was approximately 10 thousandths. No oil or lubricant used, and it was a three quarter inch four flute end mill. And then the bottom one, I fed quite fast at 1750 RPM. So let's take some readings on here and see what the differences are. This is not very scientific admittedly but yet interesting I think. Now I'll take a reading on the top sample here uh, fast feed 1100 RPM spindle speed notice that I'm right about on the center of, uh, of that pass so I'll be going uh, I'm observing the lay so I'm going across the lay of uh, the milling marks I don't know if that will show up or not here we go and then I'm going to record each reading Calculating, and it's 53 raw micro inches. And here's the middle row. That's the milling with uh, 1100 RPM and a relatively slow hand feed. And the results of that. Calculating is 48. And <clears throat> now sample 3 fed relatively fast at a higher spindle speed of 1750. And I would expect a lower number. And it's 32.
I found that extremely interesting and I hope you did as well. And there are the final readings again in micro inches on the three samples. So also interesting to note that again this is the finest one, the smaller the number, the, the, the less roughness, but I can feel on the coarse one with my fingernail I can feel the ridges much more than I can on the other two. Also with the surface uh, roughness gauge or scale there happens to be a 32 coincidentally and it sure looks a lot like Uh, my 32. Does it not? I do not have a surface grinder so we can't take any readings that way but now on to the lathe and let's uh, make some samples and take some readings with uh, that as well. Let's go over to the Logan lathe for just a minute. Now let's take a close look at the results of this uh, machining through the eyes of the macro lens and there's the, the finest one 32 there's the 48 and there's the 53 now I'm at the Logan lathe and I have set the spindle speed here and I was going to try a lot of different samples but there just isn't time to do that on this video but I have it uh, set at 800 RPM that's the middle position here and for inch and a quarter stock which is what I'm turning that uh, by calculating has given me a cutting speed of 260 feet per minute now with steel we we can cut it anywhere from 100 to 150 and even on up and since this is soft mild free cutting screw machine stock I don't think that uh, 260 can be considered too much or too fast and here's the inch and a quarter stock I just held one in in the chuck and the other with a live center and the tool that I'm using because I'm trying to get a good finish is is a round nose that oh I didn't even ground grind it it was found in my one of my boxes but since this is a quarter inch stock, a quarter inch uh, high speed steel, and someone has fully rounded it, that gives me uh, really an eighth inch radius. And I'm cutting three samples here on this inch and a quarter stock that are one inch long. And I'm cutting them all at the same depth of cut, maybe just taking off five or ten thousandths, but I am changing the feed rate. And the feed rate for the first one will be four thousandths, and then nine thousandths, and then nineteen thousandths. And I'm not going to show all of that. Here's the first sample with a four thousandth feed, and I do have oil on the work. And I'll stop it at the black line and reset the feed rate with the quick change gearbox. Here's the second sample. I have about doubled the feed rate to 9,000. And I do not expect it to be as smooth as the first one. And here, here's the third sample. And I may have misspoken a moment ago, but this will be 16,000 feet. Which is a real fast speed. Now, over to the test bench. Alrighty, here's the three samples set up on the granite surface plate. And the one on the far right was the 4,000th feet, and then uh, the middle one, 9,000th, and the far left, 16,000th feet. And uh, this is just the way I'm doing the, the samples here. I could have done this by changing spindle speed or depth of cut 
or different tools or different lubricants. There's just all different kinds of ways that we, we could test samples, but uh, to minimize the length of this video and not to lose your interest, and some of you have probably already turned to another channel, but uh, what I'm checking here is feed rate and uh, which one is better. Well, we know that the finer feed rate is, is going to be better, don't we? Or we can assume that. All right, the stylus is set on the work right on the center line, and then we're going across the lay. And uh, let's begin. And the Taylor Hobson is now calculating. And we've got 66, and I'm going to write that down. And here's the next one with a 9,000th feed. Calculating 138 micro-inches. And last but not least, sample 3 with a 16,000th feed. And it even looks coarser, doesn't it? And we'll see what this reading is, and then we'll summarize it. And it's 117 micro inches. Okay, here's the final results. And remember that the spindle speed was 800 RPM, which came out to 260 surface feet per minute. And that's inch and a quarter 12L14 screw machine with oil, screw machine stock and a 5,000th depth of cut, and it was a high-speed steel tool with an eighth inch radius of dubious sharpness. I did not hone it, it's just something that I found in a box. And the final results here for the 4,000th feed was a, a 66 uh, roughness, and for the 9,000th feed, a 95, and for the 16,000th, feed yet uh, a little bit rougher at 117. So you can see from this sample the effect of changing the uh, longitudinal feed on a lathe. And uh, I found that interesting and I hope you did. And I know some of you are thinking, well you're a champion of the obvious. We know it's going to be a better finish with a finer feed and of course, this is just to, to show you the facts, to, to quantify it. And feeling here with my fingernail, which is fairly short, I can feel a little bit of a difference, but that is very subjective. But the appearance of this sample here is definitely better than the appearance of this. Now, those of you in a small shop in your basement are often using emery cloth or files to improve the finish or to approach a final dimension, but that really is never done in production. They, they don't use emery cloth. They, so they have to decide on what kind of finish they want and how they're going to get it, either by turning or grinding and what kind of tool. So they do samples and the, the tooling companies uh, such as, uh, uh, well, what's the big one? Um, uh, can of metal. Uh, they, they have done all this kind of testing with their carbide and offer this data or information to customers. You know, when I went back to teaching part-time a few years ago, they made me go to the county courthouse and get fingerprinted, even though I had already been there for 40 years. I was really indignant about it and angry and still am. But anyway, those with inquiring minds might enjoy seeing this sample that we just did the test on through my uh, macro lens, which I bought for $15 over eBay. Now here is the four thousandths 
what looked to be uh, pretty smooth isn't very smooth at all, is it? So that's the finest of the three. And then here you can compare, you can see the line where I, where I changed the feed. It almost looks like a thread, doesn't it? This, I'm looking at this through a monitor and finding it very interesting. And you can see that there's a lot of dirt on there, even though I thought it was clean. It's not clean, is it? Then going to the next coarsest one, there's the dividing line again. And that's the 16th thousandth feed, so it's, it looks like a, a very fine thread. And remember, uh, the 16 thousandths between the high points. So the little diamond stylus was really moving in and out, wasn't it? You know, this little uh, exhibit right here in the last minute or two in itself is worth the price of admission, is it not? Since this Taylor Hobson uh, Sertronic 3 Plus is a portable instrument, it can be taken right onto the machine and if you have a way of, of uh, setting it uh, or attaching it or propping it up or whatever you need to do you can take a reading right on the machine. If it was a real large piece of work on some gigantic milling machine you could lay this right on the work once you clean it and uh, remove the chips and wipe everything down. Yes, since this instrument is portable, you can use it just about any way that uh, your ingenuity allows, or your imagination. And notice that the arm here now has repositioned. We've got a, a hole here that allows you put it, to put it in two different positions. And now I'm going to take a roughness reading on this brass steam engine cylinder. This is an item I've had around the shop for a long time. I don't know where it came from. It has been bored out by someone, but it is unfinished. And I'm getting a reading here of 75 micro inches. I know that doesn't show up. And that's what the bore looks like that I just measured. There's quite a groove in there. And since we're measuring average roughness, if, uh, if that didn't knock the tip off the stylus, uh, that, that wouldn't matter because it is measuring average. All right, that concludes the video on uh, measuring surface roughness and using the uh, Taylor Hobson machine given to me by Nick. I hope you all enjoyed this and this was a new study for me and a lot of information that I didn't know as I got ready for this video and uh, I will see you in my next video. This is Tubal Kane saying so long for now.